allow me to introduce Dr. Maria Martineau, the director of the National Research Center on Human Origins in Burgos, Spain. The topic of her presentation is From Africa to Eurasia, Human Origins through the Odovai Lens. Dr. Martineau, after you. Okay, so thank you, everybody. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and I hope I do it right. So I think this is fine. If you could confirm, yes. Yes, you're good. Okay. So I would say that I thank you so much for inviting me to participate in such a wonderful initiative that by taking Old Dubai Gorge as an epicenter is really covering a wide array of aspects related to the study of human evolution and also its dissemination to society. So thank you to Dr. Julio Mercader. Thank you to all the bodies and institutions involved. Thank you, Fergus, and all the team in charge of its organization, which I realize is very complex because of its nature. So now let's move into our, my talk. You know, as I say, the title is talking about from Africa to Eurasia, human evolution through the old Dubai lens. And the thing is that the paleontological and archaeological discoveries at old Dubai have shed tremendous light in the understanding of our origins. But beyond providing new questions and answers about specifically the evolution of our ancestors in Africa, we could say that the Old Dubai findings have helped to frame and interpret some key discoveries also in Asia and Europe about hominin variability and dispersals. So Old Dubai is like an international showcase of key universal questions we all attempt to address in the different paleontological sites we are involved in. And to emphasize the importance of the Old Dubai Gorge in the study of our origins, today I would like to draw a parallel between Old Dubai and an amazing site I have been lucky to work in, the Demanisi sites in the Republic of Georgia, especially with a particular focus in the hominin evidence. So we all know that Old Dubai consists of an assemblage of several archaeological and paleontological sites in Tanzania that cover about 2,900 kilometers where tectonic and erosional processes have uncovered sediments ranging from 2 million years to 15,000 years. Disposed in several beds, Old Dubai has provided remains that include up to two different genera Homo and Paranthropus, and at least four different hominin species, such as Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, and Homo rhodesiensis. One of the first hominin discoveries occurred in 1959. It was a molar, OH4, in bed one, a fossil that was somehow ignored because only a few weeks later, Luisa Marilicki made the spectacular finding of OH5 skull from Paranthropus boise that got all the attention. However, this molar eventually became the first find of Homo habilis. Later discoveries led to the naming of the first extinct species belonging to the genus Homo, Homo habilis, a remarkable milestone in our understanding of the evolution of the features that make us human. These hominid remains were associated to stone tools, representing an extraordinary evidence to objectively document the origin of the tool making abilities of humans. The type of specimen of Homo habilis, OH7, consisting of parietal, mandible, and hand bones, was displaying a set of morphological traits that approximate this species to our species more than to earlier hominin forms like Australopithecus, showing smaller teeth larger brain, and a hand that have some specific adaptations to make tools rather than the predominant suspensory and arboreal adaptations of the Australopithecus hand. So all the way evidence was posing some of the more relevant questions that paleoanthropologists are still dealing with. First of all is what defines us as human? What, is, what does it mean to belong to the genus Homo? Second one, how to interpret hominin variability. And this brings along a very important concept in our field, which is the concept of in mosaic evolution. And the third question that is prompted by Old Dubai is how can different hominin species coexist? How can they overlap 
in the same space and in the same time. And this brings another crucial concept in our studies, which is the one of ecological niche. So let's go with the first of these questions. What make us human? The definition of our genus Homo. Homo habilis was the first species to be directly associated with the tools and somehow was the first one to fit this idea we have of sophisticated and handy species to define ourselves. But the debate is still on. Is there a clear definition of separation between Australopithecus and Homo habilis? Is there a clear boundary? And are we really talking about a morphological discussion? We know the range of brain size is highly variable within the Homo habilis hypode. And we could have some specimens above 700 cubic centimeters and some others below 500 cubic centimeters. And in all cases, they are all well below the volume that the gross Clark established as a requirement for the definition of the genus Homo, about 900 cubic centimeters. So is it really morphological discussion? Or to really speak about belonging or not to the genus Homo, we should be looking at behavior. Is Homo definition a behavioral issue rather than morphological? In some aspects, as we will see, Homo habilis still denotes some adaptations to arboreality. Can we really accept as Homo a species that still lives in the trees? Here, as we will see, we have another challenge, which is the concept of the in mosaic evolution that makes our interpretation of the fossil record more complicated. And then there is another question regarding Homo. Stone tools? Are really stone tools exclusive to the genus Homo? Well, we know that no, they are not. We have some examples like Australopithecus gari associated to the stone tools, or we have, for example, the cut marks found in bones from the 3.3 million years old site of the Kika. All of them are good examples of association of tools with a non homo species. Perhaps it's also time that we reformulate this question. Perhaps it's not talking about stone tool use or stone tool making, but to the degree of commitment of that species to the use of those stone tools. Can that species really survive or occupy its ecological niche without stone tools? Perhaps this is the question. Is it also related with a change of diet, with hunting, with scavenging? So this debate is still going on. Even some researchers still suggest that perhaps Homo habilis should be called Australopithecus habilis. And now we move to the second of the fundamental questions prompted by all the vibe. How do we interpret hominin variability? We often face some assemblages with high levels of morphological variation. We don't know and are always clear whether we are just looking at a population, single population that really has a lot of variation. So individuals among, within this population really show high variability. Sometimes it's not clear whether those differences perhaps are related to sexual dimorphism. Or perhaps sometimes we are dealing with more than one species or populations within the same sample because they were just found mixed at the site. But this variability refers not only in the degree of expression of some features, but also in the pattern of combination of these traits. And the Oldobite hominin samples posed in a splendid manner the possibility of the in mosaic evolution of the morphological features throughout time. As an example, we have OH8, a fossil that was displaying derived features in the foot and that were showing that Homo habilis already presents some bipedal adaptations. So we're really starting to show all the features we expect to find in a species that use bipedal locomotion as the usual way of transport. However, the finding of OH16, 62, sorry, a partial skeleton of Homo habilis revealed that despite all the adaptations we saw in OH8, there were some features that were still primitive in this skeleton, particularly related to the body proportions, where the arms were relatively long with regard to the with shorter legs, and which is a feature that has been linked with the fact of perhaps having some adaptations to arboreality. So this could mean the Homo habilis was simply retaining some primitive features they were not using, or perhaps that Homo habilis was still spending some time on the trees. What we were seeing is that far from a lineal and simple transition from more primitive to more derived species, not all the skeletal parts evolve and change at the same speed and the same rate. And this combination of primitive and derived traits was different depending on the hominin group. 
and they cannot be aligned in an ordered manner along chronology. So this in mosaic evolution is a central topic in the study of evolution at any period and any region. And a beautiful case study of this can be found at the Manisi. As I'm sure all of you know, the Demanisi site in the Republic of Georgia is an archaeological and paleontological locality where the remains of up to five hominin individuals were found. It is dated to close 1.8 million years, and these hominins represent the earliest hominin evidence known outside Africa. We are talking about a small brain hominins associated to all the one technology, and which have allowed to pose interesting questions about the first hominin dispersals. Questions, as we saw, were somehow prompted by the old by findings. The hominins from the Manisi are characterized by small brain size, but as we can see, it really has a wide range of variation, ranging from 500, 540 cubic centimeters to 775 cubic centimeters. And as we also see, this is a sample that has a high morphological variation, particularly pronounced in the teeth and the mandibles. The debate about the taxonomy of these hominins has been going on since their discovery, and they have been classified either as Homo erectus, Homo sp, Affinity Homo ergaster, or even Homo georgicus. Our own analysis of the dentition revealed a mosaic of primitive and derived features. Some of the primitive features were related, for example, to the shape of their canines, which are similar to those we can find in Australopithecus and Homo habilis. In contrast, in the posterior dentition, the, some of the demanisi hominins were showing some derived traits, particularly related in terms of morphology and metrics to dental reduction that characterizes later Asian Homo erectus. So overall, the morphology of the demanisi dentitions point to a species that is more derived than Homo habilis, but more primitive than Homo ergaster and Asian Homo erectus. In other words, we could suggest that the Demanisi hominins originated before the emergence of both Homo ergaster and Asian Homo erectus. This is interesting as it matches the interpretations and conclusions that other scholars have made of the Demanisi evidence, suggesting even the possibility that Homo ergaster may have not originated in Africa, but in Asia. This scenario would contemplate the possibility of a, let's call it re-entry, of the population that gave rise to Homo ergaster into Africa. Interestingly, once again, Olduvai poses evidence that illustrates a question which is very interesting, like the possibility of two directional dispersals into and outside Africa. We often think that Eurasia is only a recipient of a speciation events that occur in Africa, but we should not forget that Eurasia can be also origin of population that can disperse into Africa as far as there are no ecological or biogeographical barriers impeding these dispersals and settlements. Um, we have a good example in Old Dubai. We have OH9 Calvaria dated to 1.2 million years that has been described as morphologically similar to Asian Homo erectus and interpreted as a possible example of a re-entry into Africa. And what about the postcranial evidence from the Manisi in comparison to that of Homo habilis. Well, with OH 67, we were illustrating the mosaic of primitive and derived features that we could find in Homo habilis skeleton, where some anatomical regions were already showing adaptations to bipedalism and some other features, especially like the length of the upper limbs, were still denoting some arboreal features. In the case of the Manisi, we also see some primitive traits, such as small body size, small brains, and also some arboreal traits adaptations in the upper arm. However, there are some aspects where the demanisi hominins are more derived or more modern-like, particularly in the length and adaptations of the lower limbs. So they have body proportions that are more modern human-like than those we find in Homo habilis. This is interesting because it's posing the idea that perhaps, although if the demanisi hominins were not showing the whole set of derived features related to bipedalims, perhaps the adaptations in lower limbs were crucial for this modern-like striding gait that allowed them to be perhaps the first ones to disperse outside Africa. And what about the mandibles? 
Well, the demand is in high, but it has provided four mandibles. One of them is an edentulous one with high resorption. So I have not included here because for comparative purposes in terms of morphology cannot be used. But I would say that among these three, you can see in the screen, there are two that has been classically and popularly called like the small mandibles, D2753 and D211, that are very different from the one has been called the big one, D2600, which has been published as Homo georgicus. As we can see, this mandible is very different to the other two, but not only in size, but also in morphology. However, despite these differences, in 2013, Lorquipanitsi and colleagues published a new skull, skull five, the skull that fits with this big mandible. And they conclude that all the individuals found at the Demanese site were belonging to the same species and that we were simply dealing with a group that has a high variation. A variation, I would say, that has not been so far in any other hominin species, but not in the degree, not even in the pattern. Our own group here, Fenia, performed an analysis of the mandibles and reached a different conclusion. The differences between mandibles were not related to size, but indeed they were related to the architecture of the mandible, to the spatial relationship of the corpus and the ramus, features that are settled very early in ontogeny and that cannot be simply explained in terms of size variation. This conclusion was also in line with our analysis of the dentition. The teeth of the small mandibles were morphologically different from those of the big mandible. And very interestingly, the small mandibles were somehow unique as they were presenting for the first time in the genus Homo, a sequence where the M1 is larger than the M2 and the M2 is larger than the M3. This is a derived feature, sorry, smaller than M2 and M3 is smaller than the M3. This is a derived feature that does not occur again until the middle Pleistocene. And that somehow was reinforcing the idea that the two mandibles were belonging to the same population with this very peculiar trait. However, the big mandible, D2600, was completely different, not only in that it was preserving the primitive sequence, M1 smaller than M2, which is smaller than M3, but also in the morphology, for example, in the highly bifurcating and molarized roots. So what we see here is that the same sample is being interpreted in two opposing ways. We should be looking either to one taxa with a high degree of variability, or we may be looking at two different populations found in the same place. And I say that Dr. Panitzi and colleagues also suggested that one of the arguments against the idea of two different populations in the site was the fact that the difficulties that are in place when we want to explain how two different hominin species can be overlapping in terms of space in the same place. And I would say that here is when we have to bring a very important concept. I would say the third of our all Dubai led questions, which is related to the competition and ecological niche. However, before we move to this third question, I would like to make a small remark regarding the overlap of the hominin populations at the Manis. And this is related to the stratigraphy. Although it is accepted that the sedimentation in the different layers of the Demanese site is fast, does not necessarily mean that all hominins occupy the territory at exactly the same time. And our own analysis shows that these hominins have been found at different sub layers with, different, with very fast sedimentation rates, but different sub layers. So as we can see in the image, the D2600, which is the big mandible that fits with D4500 big skull, are in a different sublayer than the rest of the hominins at the Manisin. So we don't have to be so sure that they were really exactly in the same place at the same time. But even if we accept that both species, if we consider that there are two different species occupying the same place at the same time, what we have to explore indeed is the issue of the ecological niche. And this is something that was posed very well, the interesting question by the Old Dubai findings. As we mentioned at the beginning of this talk, Old Dubai Gorge was portraying a moment where Homo and Paranthropus were present and indeed overlapped for more than 1 million years. 
How can this be possible? The question is bringing us to the ecological niche. Ecological niche refers to the role a species plays in a given ecosystem, their specific adaptation to a set of environmental conditions. The consideration of this concept, ecological niche, could explain the overlap between different hominin species. In this case, Paranthropos is a genus that is characterized by a high craniodental specialization, the specifically flat and wide uh, face, very enlarged posterior dentitions, powerful masticatory apparatus reflected in the reinforced muscular insertions and the sagittal and nuchal crest. And all these are specializations to hard and tough foods. This allows them to survive in a limited spectrum of resources. We are talking about tubercles, underground organs, vegetable, hard seeds, all these elements that are difficult to process and digest. And they have limited energetic value for what high amounts of intake are required. But the good side of this is that those resources may not be of primary interest for the rest of the species. And in this case, we would be avoiding competition. And as a result, physical and time overlap would not necessarily represent an ecological conflict. In contrast to Paranthropos, Homo is portrayed as a less specialized in this aspect, or we could say a more generalistic species. And this aspect is more flexible and can adapt to different and more varied resources. This is an advantage as when, for example, climatic crises occur and the type of specific resources disappear, they are in less of a challenge that it could happen, for example, with paranthropos that were very dependent in a very specific source. And in this case, would represent an advantage for Homo that was able of adapting to a changing environment. However, I think this is a very good example of how two different hominin species could coexist in time without having to compete. And this brings us now to the Manisi again. Our analysis of the Manisi evidence led us to similar conclusions. We first performed a paleopathological study of the big mandible to discard that maybe pathologies or alterations could affect the morphology of the mandible and that this was the reason for the differences with the rest of the Demanese mandibles. The second aspect was related to the particular type of dental wear found in D2600 and that was absent in the other two mandibles. What we found is that dental wear of D2600 was indicative of a high intake of fibros and abrasive foods, such as fruits and plants, as it is usually recorded in chimpanzees and gorillas, and unlike the wear pattern observed in other homo specimens of our comparative sample. We are also finding signs of pre and paramasticatory activities, such as gripping and stripping. So this all means that overall, we could be potentially looking at two different hominin populations that were feeding on different type of resources and as such, they were not directly competing. And this could explain how two different populations could overlap in time and space. And this is a bit the idea of what I wanted to bring to you in this uh, lecture. The idea that, well, thanks to all the way at the beginning, we know that evolution is far from being a linear process, as we can see in this image. What we can see is that living forms find their way of survival, like adapting to many different ecological niches that implies that we may have different branches that overlap in time, that present high variability, because this is the way that life finds its way to survive. So probably we have to finally move aside from linear stories to try to explain the evolution of the hominin species. So again, thank you so much for your interest and I'm open to any questions you may want to make. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martinot. We do have a few questions that have come up during the presentation. The first is, given the morpho morphological variability of Damasi, do you think there may be an overrepresentation of true new species in paleoanthropology as a whole? Sorry, I'm first I'm trying to, I lost, where is my screen? <laughs> Am I sharing still my, no? Yes, uh, not the presentation, but your desktop you are. Okay, so I'm just trying to. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know how to do. Okay. Okay, now I find that. <laughs> sorry. Yes. So could you repeat? I do this over representation. Yes, sorry. Yes, so given the morphological variability, do you think there may be an overrepresentation of true new species in paleoanthropology as a whole? Well, it, it could be. My idea today with this talk is like, we have to pose the big questions we have indeed is how to interpret variability, whether we are looking at a variation that is really reflecting different taxa or not. But with the case of the Manisi, what I'm posing is that we should be using the same criteria to distinguish the species in different sites. So if the set of degree of morphological differences you use to differentiate Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, you should keep the same degree of distance between these two species to assess whether at the Manisi you have more than one. And what we see with the Manisi is that the big mandible is different in such a way from the small mandibles that this degree of variability, or even if sexual dimorphism has not been identified so far in any other hominid species. So what I mean is we have to do a warning. So if we are looking at variation, we should be using the same criteria. If we all decide that a species can contain this very high degree of, of variation, I could say, okay, good, but then we should apply for the whole hominin fossil record. But not just because these, uh, these hominins, these fossils have been found in the same place, we should directly discard the idea that there may be more than hominin species. We should be always using the same set of criteria in an objective way. Right? So that's the, my issue here, you know? So the, the, the differences we see in the hominins in the Manisi is far larger than we see sometimes in species that we usually recognize as different species, even within, within Homo gaster, Homo erector, or Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, for example. Thank you. Related to this question, do you think that we will ever have a clear, definitive lineage in paleoanthropology? You think we will ever have a clear, definitive lineage in paleoanthropology? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, if, if it is about, if we always if we reach a point that we will solve our family tree, probably not. But that's what we are here for, no? to try to interpret evidence and to get closer and closer. I think science is about questions no more than about answers and every time we understand something we move to the next stage so it's very difficult to try to really solve the family trees because we have some fundamental questions we should be able of solving first like the ones i, I put today how do we recognize a species what is the amount of variation we need to really define a species it, it should be really taking into account something beyond morphology should be looking at ecological niche to differentiate a species so i think not sure that we will really find a clear lineage. We will see a clear tree, a family tree, but I'm not worried about that. I think we are really understanding in general terms how species evolved. So I am more interested in seeing how biology works, how a species survive, which type of um, adaptations we need, where are the key milestones in evolution that really fighting about names or putting fossil assemblages in, in boxes with a specific name. So I'm more interested in the biology behind than really in a very specific tree. Thank you. Our next question is, given this is a conference highlighting transdisciplinarity, what areas do you see becoming very integrated into paleoanthropology as a whole in the future? Well, there are many aspects, I, I would say. So, well, I would say that at the moment, we are witnessing a moment where there are some fields that traditionally were not involved in the study of the past and, and this is somehow is, is we are witnessing in, in life a, a, a change in paradigm, which is the inclusion of all the bio, molecular biology techniques. So studies like genetics and um, paleoproteomics, for example, are allowing us to use concepts that were not common in our field, for example, even hybridization, for example. So I think we are witnessing that a change of paradigm in that sense. So I think like fossils should be walking hand by hand, no one faster than the other, but hand by hand in, in the study of, of the past. So I think we are lacking that sense. We see an emerging new area of, of molecular biology that is adding something new. So do you think that we, there will ever be a way to map some of these genomes from these fossils? 
of which fossils in particular? Well, we know, for example, in terms of DNA, as you know, DNA degrades more and faster than proteins. But the good thing with the proteomic is that now we have a, an emerging tool to still study uh, in, in an inverse manner the genetic evidence. And we know, for example, that it was possible to retrieve proteins from fossils the, from Atapuerca, here at the site where we work at, that we're talking about the earliest proteins and hominids that have been found in human, which is with around 800,000 years. And we also know that there were some proteins found in some fauna remains from the Manisi. So I think it's about to keep trying. So I think that in that sense, techniques are, are really evolving in such a way that we could still dream about things that we never imagined we could get and, and are occurring. So I would say that the possibilities of getting uh, molecular evidence from fossils of increasing age is there. And then the final question we have is, if you could work at a, any paleoanthropological site in the world, where would it be? Oh, many, <laughs> many. I must say that I'm fortunate because I think I already work and I would say I grow up in one of the most amazing sites, which is the Atapurca sites here in, in Spain, which really covered the whole evolution in Europe from 1.4 million years to present times. Um, and, and I was saying, in a, I could also have talked about this in a parallel with Old Dubai. We have several localities that really cover a very long period of time with many hominid different species. We have Homo sp with 1.4, we have Homo antecessor, we have Homo heidelbergensis neanderthalensis, we have Neanderthal, we have Homo sapiens, so somehow it has a parallel. So I would say that I'm lucky to have grown up in one of the best <laughs> sites I could choose. But there are many, many others. I, I would love, I, I have been the chance to also work and collaborate in China. And in that sense, in China, there are many amazing localities to still provide a lot of surprises. All right, thank you very much. We That is all of the questions that we have. Um, so I think we will wrap up the session for today. Uh, thank you again. That was a, a very interesting talk. Um, and I am hoping to get myself over to the Atapurka complex soon. OK, that would be great. <laughs> so but thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure.